And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of GeneFunk 2090 and its upcoming expansion, Shadows of Korea. And a man who is doing biopunk, not cyberpunk, but we'll get to that. The one and only, coming straight from CRISPR Monkey Studios, James Armstrong. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I am doing good for a Monday. Yeah. Um, still, there's not, there's not enough ammo. I mean, snow on the ground yet, but I'm sure that'll change soon. Oh, I have had to shovel... Five times already this year, and I have about a five-foot-tall mountain of snow on every edge. Um, I also found out that some people are panicking down in Georgia because there was a little bit of snow, so I get to laugh at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, look, I get ro I get roasted by I get roasted by my warmer climate friends whenever whenever I complain about the heat. So this is what we call a receipt. Oh yeah, for sure. Unless I meet someone from Siberia, I. I got the cold card down. <laughs> oh, I was I was in the middle of that polar vortex a few years ago, so. <laughs> oh yeah, Ooh. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I've got the. Si I'm pretty sure I've got even the Siberians beat on that because that was 65 <laughs> below. That is so cold. I think the coldest day of my life was it was the minus 55 in temperature, but then with wind chill like minus 72. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, once it gets to those levels, it's just absurd. It's like yeah. you're on a different planet. But. When it comes now, I like to start with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it um, stick for you? Sure. It was uh, grade three. Like, I started early just because I had an older brother and he, it was the red box and blue box sets of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And the the idea that you could you could have like ownership over uh, creating your own character and participating in your own character there weren't very high resolution video games back then i mean we're, it was it was pre super mario brothers it was just regular mario brothers mm -hmm. so i loved the idea of being able to do that and i would uh, listen to my older brother who's i was in grade 3 he was in grade 7 at the time and he would close the door and play in his bedroom with all his buddies. I would lie down and listen under the door to the D&D sessions. <laughs> One of the, the early versions of Critical Role in 19, the 1980s, I guess. But yeah, that was my introduction was just uh, through my older brother and me just listening to his sessions and, you know, pouring through the books like it was, it was crack. <laughs> I love those, those box sets. Which I can, I can definitely, I can definitely see, and I can definitely get be, get behind that kind of thing. Um, when now you before before we went live, you had you had mentioned you had mentioned um, you had mentioned digging around when it came to Marvel Face Serp. Was oh, yeah. was that your first non D and D thing that you delved into, or were there some others that you di that you dipped in and out of over the years? That was my first non D D one. Yeah, I didn't actually even know there was other role playing games other than D D because that was just I loved it so much, and that held me over until about like ninety two or so, and then we went on a family vacation to Florida, and I saw the the Marvel box set they had. I think it was second edition, the one with the really poorly <laughs> rendered version of the Hulk on the front, but it was still mm -hmm. it was still awesome. But yeah, I picked that up and that blew me away because i was also a comic book collector at the time i was in grade nine and the fact that you could do role playing with superheroes i was like oh, you know like, insert nukes on brain animation because mm -hmm. yeah so then i played that with my little brother mostly just us two for a long time and we were both pretty good at art so we would draw pictures of all our characters so that that took us all the way until uh, i got into star wars west end games which was another another addiction for a long time yeah i could de i can definitely see that be seeing that being an, ad an addiction because lord no lord knows i wasn't far off oh yeah and, and i to this day i 
I accredit my arith- arithmetic skills to Western Star Wars. Like, it became a mini game to count those dice as fast as you can. When you got like eight dice six from your lightsaber combat with fours, you know you're you're rolling like whatever sixteen dice six, and you're adding them as fast as you can. That that builds up some brain. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to, of course, if, of course, if somebody really wanted to build up their math, they could they could always break out some um, roll master. <laughs> I've never played Rollmaster. Never, never tried that one. Um, I have. I've had a fair amount of. Ex- the th- the funny thing about Rollmaster is it started out as a rules hack of AD and D that just got out of hand and became its own thing, which is um, okay. Yeah. Which is some. Which is a far more common experience than pe- than people really know. Like it. Ha- it happens. Qu- it happens quite a bit. Yeah, I could see it. A pre Pathfinder type. Tangent from D and D. Well, um, those are well. If you well, in the Pathfinder era, you've got stuff like Fantasy Craft. That is basically what happens when Crafty Games decides to take D, decides to take um, Pathfinder and D and the D twenty system as a whole, blow it up and reconstruct it from the ground up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I love all those. Uh, older role-playing games and Mm -hmm. one of the lessons that i feel like it taught me is that as much as people uh nitpick about system mechanics really the game playing experience is very robust because it persists across i've had you know x so much fun across so many different wildly different mechanical systems some of which, like another one of my favorite games is uh, Vampire Second Edition, The Masquerade, which is like probably the worst mechanical system that I played, but so fun to make characters and so fun to play. That the, the gameplay is, I guess, my, my philosophy is that gameplay transcends mechanics in many, many ways. Not to say that there's not better and worse mechanical systems, but uh, I've had a blast across so many platforms that it kind of takes a, a little bit of a backseat versus setting and flavor for me yeah i can get i can um that's definitely something i can get i can get behind and i've certainly had my own fair share of experiences the the game personally the game that i found to be the to be my worst experience mechanically mostly because of all the extra work i had to do was um rifts oh yeah yeah i played a bit of rifts too yep I like the setting of rifts. It's Gonzo is all hell, but trying to get that thing to work for me was a pain, and it and yeah. it was the reason why I have why I have the put in a damn index policy because um, navigating a rift, navigating a Palladium book is sure. an exercise in patience. It is. I had I've read through so many of I've read through almost every Palladium rifts book, but I've only played a couple sessions. But I've just read them like I kind of read a lot of role-playing books just as for fun and uh i always thought it was interesting you know when you're you have oh i can be a glitter boy or a wilderness scholar i notice there's quite a few differences between those two yeah and when it comes now when it comes to gene funk 2090 which which um first off what where did the idea to do something like this really start? It started because I was a huge cyberpunk fan. Although we had a little chat about this uh, before we started recording. It, Ghost in the Shell, I was obsessed with. Mm-hmm. And you're mentioning, and I agree, that it th- lacks the punk aspect of cyberpunk. But it has so... M- I love transhumanism is what it is. I love uh, that it explores the fluidity of human identity as one of its major themes. Love the tech. Loves loved it. For me, the anime is a little too much exposition when it exploring the philosophy. But I mean, it's with the time frame they have. That's that's some. It sometimes it's tell not show <laughs> those kind of shows, which is fine. They they do a good job of show of showing not telling too. But you know, there's a lot of exposition in some of that that uh, those scenes. But that's where the seed of it started was with with Ghost in the Shell. And then I always had an idea that 
it we wouldn't have the 80s vision of huge metal chrome arms because uh prosthetics don't take well to the body uh the body tends to to reject them and the speed at which biotechnology is advancing is way faster than robotics technology and and like that that's my background i'm actually i have a master's degree in molecular biology because that's one of my passions as well so that's i've always been fascinated with uh with biopunk stuff even the cronenberg stuff i mean there's some deep flaws in the movies of of some of those cronenberg movies but i i love video drone you know i love uh i love all that stuff i like body horror and i think that's what it started was loving cyberpunk or ghost in the shell version of cyberpunk and also loving loving biopunk stuff loving transhumanism which i can i can cert i can certainly see um when, when it comes to now i do think that we need i do think that we need to set a few ground a few um groundings when it comes to it cuz as we talked about beforehand, biopunk is not a genre that's tackled all that often. So, how would you de how would you define biopunk in comparison to cyberpunk? I know we had talked about it being a bit of a Venn diagram, but obviously mm -hmm. there's going to be some parts where it differs and where it intersects. Yeah, yeah. For me, it is definitely less emphasis on the chrome human augmentation. And much more of an emphasis on biotechnology. So in my mind, uh, like in Gene Funk, there are prosthetic limbs and there are cybernetic implants. But a lot of the enhancements and a lot of the modification is done through molecular tools like CRISPR or more advanced versions of CRISPR in the future. Where you can get right into the human genome mm -hmm. and start manipulating genes, upregulating, just like turning up dials on a stereo mixer. You can put in new genes, or you can take existing genes and turn down the dial or turn up the dial on them. And that is much, based on today's technology, it's much more realistic that we're going to do that. And in my mind, I think it's going to be a little more palatable too. Like, people are going to be a little less freaked out when they don't have to lop off a limb to get augmented. There's still a creep factor. Don't get me wrong. Because <laughs> you're meddling with your genes. But uh, I think that is a more realistic direction. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you've seen the movie Gattaca, but that's one of the more low-key... I have. Yeah, great, great movie in a lot of ways. And it's one of the early, early movies that showed uh, a society where a large majority of the population are going to be genetically manipulated from pre-birth towards uh, enhancement rather mm -hmm. than it'll start out with getting rid of disease, which is not as controversial. And then it'll be like, uh, let's, let's just maybe dial up the immune system. I mean, that's not controversial, right? And who, mm -hmm. who wants a kid getting sick? Well, let's just dial. And as we find out more and more about what the genome does, and more and more about gene interactions. I mean, we have the tools already today. It's just a matter of uh, learning stuff and how they interact with each other. So I, I love that stuff. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. And, and this is a simple idea, but I just basically, with all the genomes in Gene Funk, I took the idea of dog breeds and uh, applied them to humans. And it's kind of gross, but that's one of the, that's one of the, the themes of, of the biopunk world is alienation from people being manipulated towards a specific task before the moment they're born. And then they're born into this predetermined role. It's almost like a genetic caste system mm -hmm. where there's a social caste. Cause of course, when you're a genetically engineered soldier, not only are you predetermined to be good at it, to like it, uh, there's also a strong social expectation that you're going to be that. Now you can diverge from that, but I, I think it's it's fun to explore stuff like that and how it's going to how it's going to affect the, that fictional world. Yeah, and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to this sort this sort of um, the sort of biopunk approach, like I said, it's fairly it's fairly rare, and the only 
The only other major game I can think of that has, that has attempted to tackle it, even though it's not doing it in exactly the same way, and it's more of a transhumanist bent, is Eclipse Phase. For sure. I love the setting of Eclipse Phase. It's it's amazing. I love it. Yeah. I I wish I would have thought about it and produced it way before the <laughs> because it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I think it's great. But obviously that is way far future and it's a spacefaring society. But yeah, I wanted to take a look at the more near future where society isn't quite at peace with all of the uh, transhuman elements right now. And there's... Mm -hmm. With with eclipse phase, there's there's straight up post humans. Like there's awake, awakened animals, and there's you know humanity itself is is almost a, a bygone concept in a lot, a lot of ways. But uh, I like I also like the transition period of history where there's going to be a lot of moral and social debates over what to do with these persons that have personhood and humanity. But there's also questions about determinism because they're they're bred for a specific purpose. Uh, in in the gene funk world, uh, corporations and governments in a lot of countries can be the legal guardian of uh, mm -hmm. of individuals. So a lot of them are batch produced in cloned batches in places called creches where they're they're raised and educated and fed because there's the economy of scale. It's not that expensive to batch produce, you know, a thousand genetically similar clones towards this particular job. And even if your return rate, even if 20, 30 percent don't end up being a soldier and working for your country, it's still a good investment. So those 70 percent that are like, hey, I'm good at this. I got a job. All of my brothers and sisters are going to do it. I might as well join the military. Why not? Mm -hmm. High paying. So yeah, that, that's kind of the angle it takes, where it's like, you have free will, you have a choice, but there's one deep groove right in front of you that's very welcoming and gesturing you t towards it. Maybe take that path, and you can hang out with all your friends and family. So uh, yeah, go for it. Be a soldier for your country. You're bred for it. Yeah. And with, the, with, that, kind of, with that kind of thing in mind... Um, when I look at when I look at the art, when I look at the art design with Gene Funk and a lot of a lot of what it's doing, um, I have I have to ask: Have you gotten people um, saying that this feels like a feels like a cyberpunk thing? And espe especially since there is another project that's doing a more cyberpunk take with um, D with D and D in um, Carbon Twenty One Eighty Five, have pe have people um, done the confusion thing with you? For sure, and I think there's enough crossover between the genres. I mean, the I wanted to make there's definitely a cyberpunk elements, mm -hmm. and there's dystopian elements as well. In Gene Funk, there are nine megacorps, so there's that element that's common with the cyberpunk genre. It's less uh, less explicit a black and white whether or not the corporations are uh, are evil though. I mean, they're self-interested. There's there's natural selection happening with corporate entities where they have an obligation to their shareholders. They just grow and make profit, and whatever works works. And, but, a lot of the elements classic uh, to cyberpunk mythos, like uh, absolute poverty, are actually not so present in Gene Funk. There's still relative, massive relative poverty. So there's hyper wealthy and hyper poor, but the hyper poor, for the most part, have enough food to eat. So I guess by analogy, it's almost a, more like a Brave New World than 1984, where the dystopia, there's a lot of kind of happiness and not a lot of starvation or massive suffering per se, but it's, it's creepy and, and strange. Whereas in 1984, it's more, you know, very dystopian and in your face with a boot stepping on your, <laughs> your head for all eternity mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever Orwell said. But yeah, it's, it's a, little, a little less explicitly black and white where the, the corporations are amoral rather than immoral. Which I can, I can, cer I can certainly, um, I can certainly go. I can certainly go with go with that because at the end of the day, a, cor a corporation is just is just going to want to make money. Um, yeah. And 
the and the whole the whole big bad evil evil corp is um to be quite honest it's a little bit pla it's a little bit played out and I'm not trying to do some pro corp defense or something but more of trying to a lot it's one of those things where the um pe where people have kind of people have kind of pushed it beyond um a parody of a parody where it it, it started with it started with a, a Good people, but a little bit of evil at the top, and then it devolved into mustache twirly levels of of it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to avoid mustache twirly for sure. I mean, there's obviously our mustache twirlers out there, <laughs> but but yeah, there's the machine is generally just a, a machine of self propagation and expansion, mm -hmm. and it produces some good effects and it produces some bad effects, and they're both big. Yeah. And when it com when it comes to now when it came to developing G Gene Funk, um, what was the reason you went with D and D fit D and D fifth edition? And what and um, when you had started when you had nailed down that you were going to do that system, what were some of the things you decided needed needed to stay or needed to go? You know, when I first started the system, it was actually in two thousand and one. So I I got a graphic design uh, diploma a two-year diploma, and I started working on it when it was third edition. So it was 2001 is when I actually started working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I finished completely a third edition version of it, but I was still a student because then I ended up going into biology. And as a student, there wasn't these cloud crowdfunding platforms at the time, and I didn't have the money to produce it. So I just kind of, I had it, I had it looking pretty good. But I didn't have the know-how, the time, or the uh, the platform to be able to, to create it. So then 4th edition rolled around. I made a 4th edition version of it. And then 5th edition rolled around. And by that point, I had ruminated enough on it. You know, I, I had a little bit of startup money to buy some art for it. And that's mostly what started it. But I do find that it does fit 5th edition most of all because of the... Um, Fifth edition is such a party, adventuring party oriented mm -hmm. system. So in Gene Funk, you're a Merc, you're basically a startup company of Mercs, you know, a very small company of, you know, three to eight mercenaries, a bit like Jagged Alliance. I don't know if you've ever played those video games. Yes. So there's a, there's a corporation in the Gene Funk world called Mosaic, which is essentially like the Jagged Alliance company. Uh, type scenario combined with tinder so when you set up a merc company or a cadre you basically swipe left or swipe right on mercs you want to work with and then once you get a group that all have swiped right on each other boom you're all of a sudden a small scale merc company and you do the dirty jobs that cartels countries corporations don't they want to have some plausible deniability and they want someone with some expertise and someone that's expendable to do the dirty work. And uh, so that, that party system of fifth edition with seemed to work well with that. All right. Which I can definitely, I can definitely, I can definitely see and doing a, cl doing a class-based setup with it means that you're not going to deal with um, choice paralysis, like cer like certain other tech punk um, games. Hi, Shadowrun. I like you, but you <laughs> yeah. know it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when it came when when it came to do, when it, when it came to doing um doing cl doing class design, um, now obviously when I look at several of the classes, I can see a bit of XP ness compared to the compared to the um fifth edition cl fifth edition class, mm -hmm. um. Was some of that intentional, and were were there some classes where you had to stretch things? Uh, so some of the classes were were very analogous to D and D fifth edition class. So there's a gunfighter class, mm -hmm. and that is very similar to the fighter class. So there there are some differences, but that was mostly a reskin of the fighter class, uh, geared towards specifically gun use, gunplay. And uh, likewise, the hard case class is 
somewhat analogous to the barbarian you know with a complete revision of the flavor towards a modern cyberpunk biopunk flair so they're not mm -hmm. they're not tribal you know kind of kind of warriors they're more just kick ass it i always try to think of characters in fiction that would fit them but you know like mel gibson and payback would be one you know the, the kind of people who just get beat up you know really <laughs> yeah modern barbarians and all of the other oh and crook is is very analogous to the rogue but the other classes are all while you could consider them a caster type classes i have three hacking classes there's the biohacker and they are exactly what you'd think they're they're basically manipulators of all forms of life and there's three archetypes for those there's one with makes their own pets there's one that is more of a classic uh deep buffer uh buffer slash damage they're called the cytomancer and they're all about doing massive buffs and massive damage with injections of poisons or diseases and then lastly there's the protean grinder which is the the self-transformation obsessed transhumanist person who wants to turn themselves into the ultimate life form mm -hmm. so those are the three paths or biohacker and then the code hacker is the classic hacker everyone knows what those are computer hackers so, <laughs> no, no this more is, it's the one that, that, that you play when you want when you want to do the hacker man voice meme yeah exactly yeah when you're into the mainframe that's that's the one you pick yeah and then there's the engineer which is make stuff blow up and then there's also the gearhead, which is all about vehicles. So, you know, kind of like I was thinking like, uh, I don't know if you saw the driver movie or things like that or baby, oh. you know, baby driver. Now, I will I will admit that I was as I was going through some of these, I was making some Shadowrun um, archetype analogies because um, that was my introduction to cyberpunk role playing was that was that. And then later on, um, cyberpunk 2020. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when when you meant when you when you mentioned the whole when you mentioned the whole thing with driver, I'm thinking that's a rigger. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, so yeah, a wheelman a wheelman rigger. That's exactly what, that's what I that's what I see out of that. Um, yeah, for sure. So if you play Spycraft, the wheelman, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, yeah. I love Spycraft. I still have my copy of um, 2.0. Yeah, for sure. And then lastly, the pet oriented one is the roboticist who mm -hmm. is all about creating the perfect robot yeah. and uh, then uh the the one class that doesn't map onto any of the dnd classes at all would be the suit probably which has some elements of the bard they're they're a face they have high charisma mm -hmm. uh but they're more akin to a james bond type character so they are more of a, a spy craft type character uh but yeah they're they're charismatic they're smooth talkers they also have one mechanic called call in a favor where mm -hmm. they get a lot of not spells, but they have a lot of type abilities where they they make a not a phone call because their phone's inside their own bloodstream. They have everyone has a computer going through their own bloodstream. They send a message to their patron. In this case, it's not a supernatural patron. It is either a super criminal cartel, political body, or corporate body that is a lot of influence, and they're able to do fun stuff like. Uh, the classic scene from Pulp Fiction where they call in Harvey Keitel, the wolf, to clean up the bodies. I don't, you, you must have seen that. Yes. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, getaway cars, airstrikes. At their high levels, they can even call in an orbital particle beam. But that's that's not till like, level 17 type play. But they're basically, when if somebody wants to play the guy who knows some people who know some people who can get things done, that's who they'd play as the suit. That's right, yeah. They're the face, and they're the, the people with connections, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it came, um, when it came, when it came to, when it came to hacking, um, because mm. given the fact that it's using slots in the, in the manner that it does, I could see some people making a comparison between hacking mm. and, um, and spell use. Oh, for sure. Um, what ways would it be similar and what ways would it be different? The ways that it's similar is, yeah, there are there are slots in hacking, and one of the main reasons I that did that is familiarity. A lot of people love digging into new real systems, and some people want something a little more familiar, something they're pre-trained in. So that's kind of what I was going 
for here is almost everyone that's going to buy Gene Funk has played D&D 5th edition. Mm -hmm. So right away as a player, I'd say about 50% of players, maybe even more, don't want to have to get through a lot of crunch to be able to do what they want to do. So by using the spell slot system, it's very, very similar. Something, something relatable, something they know about how to do. And another thing that I, I chose something similar to that was because ritual castings, I find work very well for what most people think of when for traditional hacks, you know, by adding 10 minutes onto the, in the D and D system, 10 minutes onto the spell for ritual spells in gene funk, it's adding 10 minutes onto software hacks. That's when, you know, no one's going to hack in less than 10 minutes or 11 minutes or whatever it happens to be. So I find the ritual system worked really well for doing, for being able to do software hacks without having to spend a slot. Because obviously at a certain point, it doesn't make sense that you're, oh, I'm just too tired. I guess it kind of makes sense for anyone who's done any coding. I get it. Mm -hmm. You are too tired. You're too tired to code after a while. But I wanted to have, uh, I didn't want to have a situation where I can't hack anymore. I have no slots. So that's where all of all of the ideas you have for hacking into computer map onto the ritual casting mechanic. So uh, people can do hacks by spending an extra 10 minutes. You don't have to spend a slot. And I found that works really well for being able to, to you know, crack through security, unlock a door, all those type things. And in many cases, there's even a direct parallel from the SRD. You know, the, there is things like the knock spell. Okay, let's make an unlock hack, make it a ritual. Then you can mm -hmm. crack through an electronic system. We already have the mechanics. It's been play tested in fifth edition. Bing, bang, boom. Yeah, and now one of the com one a complaint that I've often seen with hacking systems is you have the one person who's the dedicated hacker and who's trying to do the hack job while everybody mm -hmm. else has nothing to do. Um, yeah. How do you address that kind of thing with something like Gene Funk's hacking system? Right. I really, in previous iterations of the game, I actually did have something similar to that. Like I, you know, I mentioned previously was in the uh, third and fourth edition. Mm -hmm. And I got rid of that because, yeah, that is that I've played in the sessions where that happens. So that that just doesn't happen. I mean, by by mapping it on to a slot type system, there is a real time setting. So I didn't want to I didn't want to have a mini game associated with hacking. I played around with a few of them. But yeah, once you have a mini game that only 20 percent of your party can play, that's very boring for the 80 the percent of the group that can't play that mini game. <laughs> so I, I, I want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there. I briefly did toy around with the idea of, of coming up with mechanics to have everyone help out because everybody does have a super powerful computer in their bloodstream. It's shortly after the moment of birth. It's, you know, everyone has a smartphone now, but of course the smartphone eventually will get even more ubiquitous and more integrated. And in my game, it's uh, an endogenous, uh, it's a mixture of a DNA computer and an injected colony of nanobots that put a framework of wires through every alongside your nervous system. So everybody has the computer in their, their system. So I thought about toying with that. It's like, oh, everyone can kind of hack a little bit, intuitively at least. But it it just doesn't work. So I, I decided to make it more like a wizard casting knock with a computer's ability check, a D20 roll. And uh, no mini game that only involves one group of the people. But what, one of the things that was uh, I decided to use, since I do have every every single PC has a computer inside of them, mm -hmm. which like many cyberpunk games don't have that. You know, you have your dedicated decker or or hacker or whatever it is that have their data port or neural interface or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I wanted to have mind hacking. I wanted to have people give people the ability to go into the human mind and insert memories, delete memories, uh, have the entire, all of the, the, the charm school of magic essentially changed into a cyberpunk setting and being, being able to manipulate mind with, uh, with hacks. And the only way to make that successful so that most of the people aren't immune 
and and it's more realistic in my mind. I mean, how many people have, don't have smartphones today? Like even today, almost nobody doesn't have a smartphone. Yeah, just don't just don't say. Do you guys not have phones in the middle of a conference? It doesn't <laughs> yeah. end well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that 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 that's how I dealt with the the mini game for hackers was just make it like a like a, a wizard or sorcerer casting spells essentially. Mm-hmm. And within 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 the within that whole now obviously the advantage that you're going to have is you're not going to have um you're not going to have hacks that completely blow completely blow everybody out, which is a problem that um spellcasters have in D and D. Mm-hmm. You know, where you've got where you've got where you've got spells or or the like that um that out that step into other people's turf. Mm, right. Yeah. You're not. You're. Pro, we're, you're probably not going to see somebody do do some hack equivalent to a meteor swarm or something like that. There, there is one. There, <laughs> there's a couple because there's like I was mentioning previously. The suit can call in a favor to get at high levels to call in an orbital particle beam. Or a drone strafe. You know, there's all sorts of drones. One of the things in Gene Funk is the called the Argos effect, where mm-hmm. there, there's always someone watching, no matter what. Unless you're under a canopy of forest, you are being recorded, or under a roof of some type. So there are drones. There's hundreds of drones above every metropolis. Every city center has hundreds of drones. They, a bunch of them are Amazon delivery drones. A bunch of them are, are intelligence drones owned by either a country or corporation or individuals. The sky is filled with legions of drones. Mm-hmm. And once they get to like the fireball level hacking ability, they can hack into the ubiquitous, one of the ubiquitous military drones that is flying above them and call in drone strikes you know they, they don't have to go far because drones are everywhere so they are able to to bring in some good aoe probably more so than the other classes but they have other than the biohacker the biohacker is very good single target damage but the other two hacker types are more area of effect hack, hacker damage type characters more debuffers area of effect type stuff which I can I can um get I can get that. And when it come now when it came to the when it came to the the um when it came to a, a class like the sa- the samurai. Now obviously I see samurai and I immediately think of of uh, street samurai or, or the like, but mm-hmm. what was what was the reason what was the reasoning to build that around some of the motifs with the monk? Yeah, so the I'm I'm well aware of the street samurai thing, but in street samurai and cyberpunk, they're more just kind of like fighters, you know, like mm-hmm. cyborg fighters. Whereas I wanted to go back to the origin of the word samurai, which means one who serves, and make them have an honor system where they're rather than serving a daimyo or a shogun or whatever it is, they are they're kind of like paladins who serve a contract. So. It's not a lifetime loyalty, although there are samurai who will sign a lifetime contract for a particular government or a particular corporation or person if the contract is good enough. But once they have signed that dotted line, then they're they're kind of like the paladin of they have a huge honor culture. They've graduated from this elite academy of uh, of mercenaries and bodyguards where it is very shameful to breach a contract. Uh, in terms of of their monk similarity, it was mostly just because I wanted them to be good at martial arts. I wanted them to be able to dodge well. I wanted them to be able to move well. And I wanted them to be able to be good at unarmed combat. And those are the three things that uh, that I bored from the monk class, because those are three built-in mechanics they have. You know, the flurry of blows, the patient step, and the step of the wind. Now, key there, key in in this system is much more metaphorical it's more like it's probably more like we use key in the real world real world which is mm-hmm. where the word comes from is like a, a vital energy you know not not something necessarily mystical or supernatural but just like juice you know <laughs> like enthusiasm or, or whatever you want to call it so i do have the key mechanic but it's it's mostly just a, a flavor difference where it's not gonna it's not magical or mystical it's mm-hmm. just you know like 
a, a metaphor, a, a semantic term for your inner drive. Which is prop is, which, I'm perfectly fine with the set with the setup that's that's here because it me because it means that I'm not gonna have to deal with um, with having to justify everybody else being armed to the teeth, and then you've got the samurai who, because of the fact that he's supposed to be monkish, is using his bare hands. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, although, yeah. given the given the um. Up, given the upcoming Cyberpunk twenty um, twenty seventy seven, I'd be curious what analogs you could you could go with when it comes to the roles that um that game has. Because I like, and I know that I know that might sound a bit a bit odd to do, but I can see people trying to trying to cross over from one to one to the other, and I always encourage crossovers and character conversions. Yeah. You know what? I have not uh, yet picked up Cyberpunk Red, and I I can't wait to get the video game. But the last yeah. Cyberpunk that I played was, uh, you know, twenty twenty Cyberpunk twenty twenty. Well, that's the that's the one that I that's the one when I did the um when I did the Life Path experiment on the channel a few weeks back. That was the one that I used. I didn't use third edition, and I okay and yeah, yeah Red hadn't been out yet, and I don't I don't imagine them adding new roles. So I I would like so. There's a few that there's a few that I can see that I can guess at, um, but I'd like I'd like to know what you would consider the equivalent. And I'll just I'll just go I'll just go through each. Oh yeah, um, yeah, sure. This is a bit of a thought experiment because we like to do yeah. things a little bit different here. Cool. Um, first would be Rocker Boys. Rocker Boy, I don't have a. That's not. There's no class based around Rocker Boy right now. The closest would probably be the. Uh, dealer crook or a a shark suit uh but there's no that might be an upcoming class for a future edition because yeah. i do like it they're they're more the explicit type of bard where they're they're a perform right now that's covered by backgrounds in mm-hmm. g-funk so you could pick the performer background yeah. um and then with that performer background map that onto any of the other classes yeah um solos so those definitely gunfighter for sure. A little bit hard case, but mostly gunfighter and a little bit of samurai maybe. Mm-hmm. I'd say it could be either one of those, just depending on the build. Yeah. Um. Netrunner. Netrunner for sure. Code hacker. That's like straight up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'd <laughs> yeah. say that's one of the easier ones. Um. Yeah. Techie. Engineer for sure. Though with uh, they have that the med tech. Uh, subclass or whatever I can't remember phrase it, but that would be. I expanded biohacker quite a bit, which kind of maps one of the biohacker archetypes is a med tech. Yeah, but the the other it's it's a completely different thing. I don't mm-hmm. think there's an analog. Um, media. Media probably suit, yet yeah, suit, or depending on I don't know if you saw that movie a Nightcrawler, mm-hmm. but possibly yeah. Crook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. Okay, apparently it's been retitled to Lawman in Cyberpunk Red, but Cop. Oh, yeah. Cop could either be a suit, because one of the archetypes is actually called G-Man, which would include detectives. Mm -hmm. Uh, Could also include Gunfighter or Hardcase. Or Crook. (laughs) Wow, Batman playing good cop. (laughs) Um, Corp. Definitely... Suit with the archetype shark. Mm-hmm. Fixer. For sure, crook dealer. Right. But also, you know, suit, there's some elements of the suits could work with that too, because suits can also have one of their their patrons being a uh, criminal cartel. Mm-hmm. Um, nomad. Nomad for sure, hard case. And that is, some, that is something, something that I find. I find it I find interesting cuz the way cuz given the given the fact that they that would you would you say that would you say that um what would you say is the defining lo- the defining line in a lot of cases between say samurai and hard case since they're both most definitely melee centric classes Yeah, I would say uh mobility and samurai has more of an Ability to do ranged builds. They're they also uh, I built them as the um, 
if you want to go dual wielding, they're probably gunfighter can do dual wielding well too. But samurai is going to be a you're more likely to do a dex based build with dual wielding with a samurai, mm. and that's off the table with hard case. Would you say that that um if somebody wanted to go for, if somebody wanted to go for the te- for the tanky end of things, they would go, they would lean towards hard case. Oh yeah, that's undisputable. They they're the only class with a D twelve, and one of their archetypes is called damage sponge, which <laughs> yeah, so that has one of the popular features from the SRD, the totem of the bear, where. Mm-hmm. When when you're raging, you take half damage. They don't rage, but they have a feature that they can use once every short rest, where they take uh, half damage from all all incoming damage. Which which um makes sen- which makes sense. Uh, now when it, now um when it what was when it comes to the concept of daemons um where where did the idea for that come from? Was that just the means of making it so that you weren't having to deal with some equivalent to cyber decks. That came from a, there's a it used to be called something different. It used to be called the Churve in earlier editions, which is a computational human endogenous retrovirus. It's like an anagram for that. <laughs> and fun fact, but eight percent of the human genome is actually viral DNA, which is mind blowing. But na- mutation is one of the uh, major drivers of genetic change in natural selection. So is recombination through sex, sex, and there's also v- retroviruses will come in every now and then and introduce novel DNA because they're viruses that bring in novel DNA. So one of the one of the most notable adaptations that humans have is that the reason why we're viviparous is once upon a time long ago a retrovirus came along and told the mother not to view the offspring as an invader. Because normally, shells were required for that. Otherwise, the mother's immune system would attack their baby because it would have half of the DNA of the, the father, and it would, be, it would be considered a foreign body, mm-hmm. and it would blast it with, uh, with antibodies. So this, that's, this is just one example of, of an adaptive part of a viral DNA that we have in our own genome. And... One of the reasons why we're, we have live birth is because a virus came along randomly, inserted some viral DNA, and it just happened to, to work for, for us to have live birth. So once I learned that uh, 8% of the human genome is viral, I was like, holy hell. And then I learned about gene, DNA computing. And I was like, oh, that, that'd be cool. So I had this, this scenario where a mad scientist released a plague, a retrovirus, that basically encoded a DNA computer into every single person that caught a version of like the common cold. Like mm-hmm. you released a common cold that was a retrovirus that encoded this DNA computing. I made it less mustache twirly. <laughs> so there's not one mad scientist, mm-hmm. but there's now, now it's the, the daemon is uh, people voluntarily get it. Cause when I first came up with this, it was before smartphones. So I didn't realize that, uh, everyone would voluntarily do this very shortly after it started because of how awesome it is. You know, like when you look at how ubiquitous smartphones are, mm-hmm. once people see how awesome it is to have an internal biocomputer, it'll be a decade at most, maybe 20 years before everyone just chooses to do that because it's so easy and great. So the daemon is a bio- a mixture of biology and nanobots that construct a network of microfibers throughout your that go in parallel to your nervous system and work with your ner- nervous system so every single person shortly after the moment of birth acquires their first daemon which is this innate not quite innate sh- shortly postnatal uh computer and daemon also is the name for the operating system of that computer and just like we have Siri today, mm-hmm. that's only going to get more and more sophisticated. And I kind of borrowed f- one of my favorite movies is the movie Her. I don't know if you ever saw that. I have not seen that one. Fantastic. It's like it's they they have so much dense science fiction in the background where it's just a it's like a love story in the front. But in the background, there's a lot of dense science fiction and transhuman stuff. But 
obviously the direction of AI is going to be going more and more sophisticated and there will become a point where all AI will pass the Turing test if they so choose. Mm -hmm. So the daemon is an example of a, an operating system slash artificial intelligence companion slash native biocomputer. Everybody has. Some people fall in love with their own daemons. They're their best friends. They're, there's, I thought about playing with some mechanics like a uh, Wraith second edition where you can have other player characters play your shadow, you know, where you could have other player characters just play each other's daemons. Mm -hmm. But that gets a little messy in practice, even though it's a cool idea. So I just kind of left it as uh, it's, it's a character within you that you can consult with. Yeah. Like Jarvis or whatever. <laughs> And I'm gu I'm guessing you went with the term daemon because of how that term is used in um in cl in classical in classical um philosophies. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, because it's also pronounced demon, mm. and I like I like that allegory. And then there's the little literal definition of processes that happen in the background, which I, that fits. Yeah, I, I liked it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was when I saw when I saw that entry. That was what immediately came to mind, and a little bit of the sin from Shadowrun because there's the option to not use a um de use a uh, demon. Yeah, which yep. has um be has benefits and has dra and has um drawbacks. Um, right. Much in the same way that there's advantages and disadvantages to having a system number. Yep. yep. Um. Now. One of the, now, um, obviously, one thing that is not in fifth edition's rule set is, um, is, stu is stuff like detailed, vehic detailed vehicular combat. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, you, uh, you addressed this when it came with some, with some motifs when it comes to chases. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, I don't have a lot on there. I wanted to keep. I actually adapted the chase rules from, oh, and I try to remember the person. I adapted it from someone that I found online that released it as Creative Commons, which was very wonderful of him to do. And, oh, I'm trying to remember who, their name. Well, it's it's in the Gene Funk reference. I referenced their name. Mm -hmm. But the chase mechanics are meant to be quick and cinematic and not used very often. <laughs> that actually is a mini game. But it is a mini game that everybody can participate in. Yeah. And and now, I know we've I know we've danced around it, but let's get in, let's get a bit into Shadows of Shadows of Korea. Now, mm -hmm. first off, this being the this being the first big expansion, what were some of the learning experiences that from um, from the from the core gene funk that you wanted to apply to this expansion with Shadows of Korea? One was uh, no matter how much editing you do, and even if you hire a professional editor, there will always be typos. <laughs> so I gave a lot more of a space between the time of the finished PDF and the print run for this one, mm -hmm. because I, I hired a professional editor. I went through it. My friends went through it. I we had you know there was I crowdsourced editing because all the play testers were looking at it, but despite that, there I still found dozens like. Between the time of printing and I think it was early 2019, and now nothing crazy, but you know, dozens of little typos, and they really frustrate me. So one of the things I learned was just to uh, allow more breathing room between the time of finishing the PDF and submitting it for print mm -hmm. to to catch more of them. Yeah, and. The other, the other big question that I wanted to ask, because I look at the way you described um, Shadows of Korea, is is this this is meant to be a um, sa a sandbox area, correct? It is, yeah, that's right. So it is. Uh, part one is just the city of Busan, South Korea. Or I guess it's Korea by twenty ninety, mm -hmm. and it is a description primarily of the major players. The they could be factions uh, or individuals within those factions and their motivations. Because I figure once you give factions and NPCs motivations, 
then you don't have to get into great detail beyond that because they that's really all they as a gm all you really need is an npc or a faction to want something and once they have a few general i give them general goals and specific goals once i give them those goals that's everything the gm needs to know how to handle them because they know what they want and as they're everything's a negotiation everything is them trying to get what they want so there doesn't need to be there is ex, some exposition, but once you know that's like the bullet point for for each one of those NPCs, each one of those factions, uh, they want this thing. So you have a you have this world, you have a geography, you have these NPCs and factions that have goals. All you have to know is they're trying to get those goals, and when they interact with the PCs, they're going to try to manipulate the PCs to get use them to get those goals, or stop the PCs so they can get those goals. Which makes sense. Which makes sense. Which makes sense. Um, the other question I have is, of all the different places that you could do that you could do, um, Korea seemed an interesting choice because that's not really an. In as a general rule, it's not a. Um, it's not a. It's not a part. It's not a part that's tackled a lot in role playing game books. I I do remember that there was one that did a fantasy take on on Korea that came out a couple of years ago. Whose name unfortunately um, escapes me at the moment. I'm probably and that and that might be for the best because I'd probably mispronounce something and then get hounded again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it comes to cyberpunk, especially, a lot of a lot of the time, you that cyberpunk is tackled. You're either de you're either dealing with um, with east Co with um, west coast United States mm -hmm. or Japan. Which is right. which given which given the um, state of Japan in the eighties definitely makes a lot of sense. But in your case, you went with mm -hmm. Korea, and I'm curious as to why. There's a few reasons. Uh, one is that I actually I went I lived in Korea for for over three years myself, and I've traveled to Japan quite a bit, and a lot of the stereotypes I had about Japan I actually found in Korea and didn't find in Japan. <laughs> you know, so some of them are in Japan still, but yeah. The, when you have that cyberpunk aesthetic, usually it's a sea of neon. And there's there's something so amazing about Korea's night that is so beautiful. And when you look at a lot of the art that comes from photos of the real world that cyberpunk, a lot of them will be in Korea because there's this accidental aesthetic where all these individual mom and pop shops put up tons of neon signs mm -hmm. and they go all the way to the horizon so at daytime it looks a little dingy it doesn't look uh some parts like obviously some parts are, are you know all sorts of amazing architecture but for the most part it's, it's got a lot of character but it looks kind of like a little a little yeah a little rough around the edges but at nighttime it just lights up and right into the horizon you just have this long column of pure neon all the way to the horizon and that aesthetic is incredible and technology is korea actually copied japan's model of economic development after they saw how successful it was so they dived head first into the tech and were maybe 10 years behind you know there was there was a, i'm not sure how old you are but there was a time where samsung was a distant follower to sony but now, now Korean tech is top notch. They, they they follow that model to the extreme. So a lot of those stereotypes that we have from the '80s Japan exist now today in Korea. So it's a mixture of me having lived in Korea for over three years and and loving it, and then I I think the modern aesthetic fits it even better because it's it is it is like that cyberpunk setting. And then lastly, I picked the city of Busan because of the geography. I mean, port, port towns are amazing. It, even in fictional settings, a lot of the D and D Forgotten Realms world cities that are amazing are port towns. You know, like Baldur's Gate or right? this. The Sword Coast is. There's even that the joke that the Sword Coast is all Forgotten Realms because they're all port towns, and it's kind of fun to have a port town. Yeah, because you get all all the skullduggery and all the all the illegal imports and exports. But Busan is like one of those cities in in real life because it is a stone's throw away from Japan, mm -hmm. from Vlad Vladivostok, Russia. From Shanghai, China, from Taiwan, it is a port town that is very close to all of those places. 
So I incorporated all of the criminal underworlds of all those respective places. So there's a Shanghai Triad in Busan making inroads. There's the Fukuoka Japan Yakuza, which is a very... There's even a... It hasn't been done in this world at this time, but there's talk of a underground tunnel being built between Fukuoka Japan and Busan South Korea. Mm-hmm. And by 2090, that happens. So that is a huge avenue for both legal and illegal trade. Yeah. And then also what happened when the KGB fell in Russia is that a lot of the ex-KGB ended up becoming the Russian bratva, the Russian mob. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when you have an economic collapse and you have a huge group of people that were previously well-funded, highly trained, and their skill set now maps on perfectly to to stuff that they are no longer allowed to do, so they end up going to the underworld. Well, in 2090, I have that happen with North Korea. So I have North Korea and South Korea become a single nation, and the entire North Korean military, or large segments of it, constitute the 2090 North Korean mafia, one of the most mm-hmm. powerful mafias on the planet. So I thought all those things just made an interesting, an interesting setting with lots of geopolitical conflict and yeah there's just lots of diversity there yeah and i can def i can definitely see i can definitely uh, see that now when it comes to when it comes to the corporate end of things um like a like a lot of first now for those from for those familiar with gene funk how many of the cor- how many of the corps would be familiar and how many of them would be more exclusive to busan so all of the, on a macroscopic level, there's nine mega corporations. Mm. Uh, until, in the game setting, there was a pandemic, and I I wrote this before Corona <laughs> came out. So and I had a plague that killed five percent of the population. I'm like, I don't know if the world would react that strongly to a plague that kills five percent of the population. Maybe I should make it higher. But now I realize, no, no, the five percent is plenty to make <laughs> an entire global global cultural shift. Because wow, that will that will that would definitely happen. So a plague happens, and then because of the economic collapse that follows the plague, all antitrust laws are abolished. There's a feeding frenzy among multinational corporations. So they gobble each other up because there's no antitrust laws. So they get very big until they narrow down to nine. And then once they're at nine, then antitrust laws are reestablished, and the corporate wars temporarily cease. So. There is one major corporation that has gobbled up all of almost all of the Korean and Japanese corporations under one umbrella. It took a lot of marketing campaigns to ease those tensions between those three countries that have a lot of frictions. But they were able to come up with a transnational identity for the corporation. So a lot of them are from this one company called Hekshi, which means harmony in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the the corporate intrigue in Shadows of Korea is about other corporations trying to make inroads into Korea, which is a Hexi, not monopoly, but definitely an oligopoly where Hexi is the dominant player. So there's companies coming from the states and from other countries that are trying to make inroads, and that's that's depending on who the player characters decide to ally with will shape the the direction that Busan takes. All right, I can definitely get I can definitely get behind th- that kind of thing. And when it co- now, given the f- given the fact that you've got gangers on one end and the co- and the corpse on the and the corpse on the other, um, mm-hmm. is this more? Would you say that this is more of a hot war between the between the corpse or more of a co- or more of a cold war where, if there is any sort of active conflict between them, it's usually handled with the gangs as XPs. Rather than rather than corporate security going all, going all out against each other, it's definitely a cold war, but it's heating up. So yeah, that there well there was no formal war between the corporations. Previously, there was mm-hmm. something that was dubbed the corporate wars, which was more more bloody and more overt. But now, it is, it almost is completely through proxy and cat cat's paws. So. 
it is def I would say it's a, a cooler, but it's heating up. There's more and more violence happening uh, as the year 2090 is unfolding. And a lot of it is revolving around this major trade secret, which is digital immortality. So mm -hmm. there is one company, and it's a very recent technology that has figured out how to upload, do mind uploading. And they're they're called psycho mimes. And as far as anyone can tell, and as far as the psycho mimes self-report, they are identical with the person that died. So it's a a subscription service that player characters can eventually get. It's it's the, a version of resurrection or raised dead or or what have you. And only one company has that trade patent. So all of the other corporations want to get that. Because yeah, it is. It is highly desirable. Everybody wants to live forever. Well, except for Freddie Mercury. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And th Fred. and there's my and there's my requisite queen joke for the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could have I could have gone with referencing in time, but not but not enough people have seen that movie. I don't think I've seen the movie. Is that the one with Justin Timberlake? Yeah. Okay, okay, I know of it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, which um, I'm not gonna say that it's great. I mean, it it is basically a a it is basically taking a, taking one too many notes from Bonnie and Clyde. But um, I will admit I ha I have a bit of a soft spot for it simply because I like high concept work. Yeah, me. You know, I have a soft spot for. I often say with sci-fi premise does a lot of work mm -hmm. um that's why even though it's got even though it's got some holes in it i will freely watch Inse inception when it comes when it com when it comes on i'm not obviously gonna go out looking for it but if it's on i'm gonna enjoy it yeah for sure i i often find that i mean yeah if if someone's got a good premise th there's certain movies though that i love the premise and i still haven't seen like surrogates with bruce willis Mm -hmm. I heard it was savaged by reviews, so I just haven't watched it because I don't have the heart to <laughs> to see a, a cool premise murdered like that. Which I I can def I can definitely understand. Now, now when it now when it comes to the, would you say that the would you say that Shadows of of Korea is is more is more of a sandbox thing or what or will there be uh, material to when it comes to adding to the player end of the of uh, the sand there is a there's a little bit for something for everybody so i do have some interrelated contracts which are they're in set in the sandbox but they're interrelated and have the same npcs and factions involved so there is more of an established narrative with a few of the the contracts that are depicted in the book mm -hmm. and then at the end of the book each of the classes gets a new archetype and there's a few new genetically engineered genomes. So a bit like Xanthanar's Guide, where there's a few new feats, some new equipment, new archetypes, and new genomes. Except there's a bit of focus in this thing, which makes it better than Xanthanar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, um, but no beholders, sadly. <laughs> um, given the fact that you're dealing with a biopunk game, give it a week. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if yeah. if you don't come up with it, I guarantee I guarantee you what I guarantee somebody playing it will, or finds yeah. or finds some sort of excuse to have to have that kind to have that kind of thing. For sure, whenever I was making a genome, I always had a little virtual uh, boardroom where Don Draper was pitching the genome because it was like all of these are made for a purpose, so there has to be at some point some suit who's pitching this thing to the money. The money roll people. Mm -hmm. so, so, what is the, what is that pitch going to be? I got to include that in the genome description. Especially, especially since the um, every, when deal when dealing with corpse, obviously there's going to be there's going we got to go with the cliche of that of that experiment that they decide to lock up instead of killing, and then some <laughs> and then somebody discover, discovers and go, and. And goes, hey, what, hey, what'll happen if I unlock this? If I unlock this thing that they had several armed guards and several layers of digital security to try and keep locked up? Oh, would you look at that? Everyone is slaughtered. Who could have <laughs> seen that have, coming? I do have something like that. That tr that trope exists in Shadows of Korea. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, 
obviously now um when it comes when it, now um when it comes to when it comes to some of the archetypes that you're that are going to be added obviously we can't go into too much in the way of spoilers but could you give a few examples of some of the new archetypes that are that are going to be gone into yeah for sure Okay, so the archetypes one there's going to be a new samurai bojutsu, mm -hmm. and that's that's samurai are the one class that don't get different archetypes, but each of them select different bojutsu paths, and they can pick and choose. They're similar to feats, but they're specialized towards samurais. Mm -hmm. And the new bojutsu path is all about diplomacy. So this is the diplomat samurai who's sent in to negotiate contracts, to make peace, to intimidate. So that's the the samurai archetype. The guy who says you should have taken the money. Exactly. Yeah. And then there is for the biohacker, I wanted that I wanted the classic limb chopper. So that's the cyber doc. So they're mm -hmm. they're going to be specialized into getting cheap cyberware for everyone, but you don't want to roll a 1 on a 20-sided dice when you're using that cyberware at first. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they even get a fun ability later on where they make secret clones of all of the cadre members. So if they die, they have a backup. Not necessarily ethical, but, you know, who's going to argue after they've been resurrected? I have, uh, for code hacking, I have the intuitive hacker archetype. And for the crook, there is the more of a face crook. So more of the, the grifter, the con man. Oh. For engineer... Engineer, I got more kind of an like Iron Man archetype who is all about upgrading their suit of armor as they level up. And yeah, those are a few of those are. Oh, and then the suit, I have the, the operator, which is all about making a plan. So that's the heist archetype. Then they get all sorts of bonuses. A bit like the divination wizards where they can, you know, they don't get to predict the future through magical means, but they're like Batman. You know, they have a plan for everything and a contingency plan for everything. Which I can I can definitely make sense out sense out of. Um now what what would you be what would you be shooting for as far as a page count with the with the I think? Uh, because of the stretch goals that were recently reached, it's probably gonna be around 192 pages. So right now it's sitting at 160, mm -hmm. but there's gonna be 32 new pages. Uh two new contracts are gonna be added. One called Blimp Heist and one called Delete the Ghoul. And Blimp Heist is just because once I found out that Amazon is going to move to delivery blimps and drones at some point, I mean, that's going to be a sweet heist to try to <laughs> to try to jack one of those delivery. It's like the classic train heist, but it's a blimp, which I just I love the idea of. So I'm making a, a contract based on doing a heist on a blimp because it's got all the fun of a train heist. Plus, it's in the middle of the air, which I, I think is great. Although per personally, when I think when I think of when I think of the whole blimp thing, I'll, the only thing that comes to mind is that is going to be the that is going to be the biggest duck hunt LARP I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Look, that's just that's just how I see it. that's just how I see it. <laughs> I, I can't I can't help my nature of being a natural shit poster. <laughs> yeah, for sure with that little dog. <laughs> yeah, I fucking hate that dog. <laughs> yeah. But even now um you now I do want to give you I do want to give you your congrats because you were shooting for 5000 Canadian and you're just over 34000 at the time of this recording with um with 9 days to go. Now you had now um now assume now presuming all the paperwork gets Get sort get sorted out in a timely fashion, which I'm knocking on wood on that. Since um, e since no plan survives the first encounter, mm -hmm. um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, for the right now, the beta for the PDF is already complete. So I just the editing the first draft of editing will be done in just a few days. And once this crowdfunding campaign concludes on December 10th, that will be that beta will be available for everyone. So it's at 160 pages now. It's not doesn't have the delete the ghoul and blimp heist contract, and some of the NPCs haven't been fully fleshed out yet. But mm -hmm. it's, it's a 
fully complete PDF ready to go. So for digital content, that's ready to go right in December, late December or early January. And as far as the physical books, those will be out in June. But I do have a, I have the core book obviously already printed. So on the one hand, people could wait to get both books together for reduced shipping cost. But I'm going to include the option, if you want the core book mailed to you right away, pay 10 bucks extra and get them shipped separately. Because obviously it's cheaper to ship two books together than one, one books, two books separately. But yeah, just in case, you know, some people want it right away. So, so I want to give that option. All right, that makes, that makes sense. Um, and I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And I'm, I'm guessing you're going to be doing the same um, hyperlink set, setup that you did with the PDF for Gene Funk, which I most wholeheartedly appreciate because, as I said before, navigation is a big deal for me. Oh yeah, for sure. I want to, I want to even improve on that for the core rule book, but yeah, I want to add more and more. Anytime there's one thing that I didn't include in the core rule book, because uh, I, there were no other books to reference to in shadows of Korea, I include page numbers for all references. So I want, I'm going to hyper hyperlink those page references. Well, I'll, I'll see what I can do about inter PDF work, but uh, I don't. That might not be doable. Uh, but I'm going to hyperlink as much as I possibly can, and at the very least, I have written down whenever anything is mentioned that's referenced in the core rule book, uh, page numbers are are included. All right, I can I can I can definitely get that. Um, and like like I said like I said um, the. Getting getting proper navigation with it with indexes, hyperlinks, and the and the like is a big deal for me because when I need to look up a rule, I'd rather look it up as quickly as I can and not have to do a whole lot of jumping. I know pe I know everybody talks. I know everybody's been trying to talk me into setting up D and D Beyond, but I'm like, I do a whole lot of house ruling and I do a whole lot of third party stuff. D and D Beyond is going to be no help for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I made sure to have that same sidebar in Shadows of Korea, which is uh, at the very least the on the left there's an omnipresent bar that you can click for chapter starts, mm -hmm. and then within the text I also have quite a bit. And when it and it's like I said, it's definitely something that I'll be I'll be looking for I'll be looking forward to when the time when the time comes. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Thanks. It was and, a pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I certainly did. And of <laughs> course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!